We're ready to go, it looks like. So, we'll call this meeting to order. This meeting is being recorded. <laughs> okay, now we'll call this meeting to order. And uh, so welcome to the Thursday, March 23rd uh, meeting of the Park and Rec Advisory Committee. So, uh, we're gonna introduce ourselves. I'm Tim West, uh, the president of the Park and Rec Advisory Committee. Uh, Steve Williams, uh, I'm the vice, vice chair of the committee. Uh, Joey Knopf, member of committee. Ken Wooster, member. All right. You want to call out Emily? Emily's on. Oh, uh, I am Emily Lisborg, uh, member. And Tim. And uh, Tim Lanehart, uh, member. Great. So uh, the first um, item on the agenda is to approve the minutes from the last meeting. And do I have a motion to um, to approve the minutes of January 26? So moved. Okay. Second. I'll second it. Okay. It's been uh, moved and seconded, and we've passed the approval of the minutes. A roll call. A roll call. Yeah. Oh, I got to vote on it. Yeah, yeah. You got to vote on it. Oh. Okay. <laughs> vote on it. <laughs> so go ahead. Yeah. You got to call. Each individual. Yes. Ken Worchester? Yes. Joey Knopf? Yes. Tim West? Yes. Steve Williams? Yes. Tim Lanehart? Yes. Emily Lisborg? Can't hear you, Emily. Yes. Can you Thank hear me? You. Yes. Thank you. All right. So the next item on the agenda is public comment. So we give citizens uh, three minutes to go ahead and comment. There was no request for public comment. Okay. We have no public oh, comment. Um, I'm sorry. I think Kara is here for public comment. Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes. I turn my camera on or anything, or is this okay? This is this is perfectly fine, but just wanted you to be aware. Normally, the protocol for public comment is they contact us to let us know that they want to provide public comment, and then we communicate that to you. All right, Tara, this is out of protocol, but just for today, we'll let you okay. do some public comment. So go ahead. I apologize. It was very last minute. I was invited by Emily last minute. So yeah, I Yeah, sorry, that was my fault. No I didn't, problem. um I forgot. <laughs> okay, are you ready for me? Go ahead. Go ahead, Tara. Are we good to go? Yep. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time to hear from me today. My name is Tara Scott and I'm a resident of Oregon City. Yesterday, March 22nd, 2023, I was at Hillendale Park with my two autistic sons, ages five and seven. My youngest son was drawing with sidewalk chalk as he had done many times before at a varying playgrounds around the city when we were approached by a park worker. He informed us we were not allowed to draw with sidewalk chalk in the park. We responded by politely stopping. Then he rudely asked us, how do you suppose we clean this up? To which I responded, I knew it was going to rain that night, so I figured the rain would wash it off. He rolled his eyes at me, mumbling something, got back in his cart and drove away. A few minutes later, he returned with a tub of water and proceeded to scrub off my son's art right in front of him. Both my boys were obviously upset and confused. Feeling upset myself, I went home and looked on the city's website to find that chalk is in fact not allowed at the playground. Confused by this, I decided to ask the community how they felt. After all, the laws and regulations made by city lawmakers should reflect the ideas and feelings of the community. I asked on an Oregon City Facebook page who would be offended or bothered by sidewalk chalk at the park, thinking maybe I would get some these stairs, but was surprised to find that over 100 people felt as I did, that chalk is harmless and no one should be banned at a public park where children are meant to play and have fun. The Portland metro area prides itself in freedom of expression. We value being different and encourage art of all kinds. In the park rules and information on the city's website, chalk is listed along with water balloons and silly string. I believe this to be a mistake. Water balloons and silly string can cause permanent damage to structures, the environment, as well as any animals living in the area. Chalk is non-toxic and water soluble. And as the man at the park yesterday proved, it can easily be washed away and does not cause permanent damage. 
I would encourage a change in this rule, as children such as my, as my son, who live in apartment communities with no drawing space of their own and suffer from overstimulation and anxiety, sometimes will not even want to go to the playground. And if it was not for his chalk, he would have missed out on countless interactions with other children. This harmless activity is one we all participated in when we were kids. I say bring back the hopscotch and the rainbows. Get kids out of the house and off the electronic devices. Chalk has many times brought us together with our community as other children and parents have joined in. However, if the city does not see changing this rule as beneficial to the community, there can be other alterations made, such as being sure to post signs of these rules in the parks and not assume residents will visit the website before visiting the park. Chalkboards or designated areas for drawing can also be added to local playgrounds for approved places for children to express themselves. And finally, workers can be trained on sensitivity, so when they are addressing residents, they do so with kindness and understanding, and perhaps wait until someone is gone before erasing a child's art. Thank you again for taking the time to listen to me today, and I hope some positive change will come from this experience. Tara, thanks for your, uh, your comments there. And this is uh, uh, Kendall, um, do you have any comments on that? Uh, John and I discussed the, the issue with chalk. Uh, I, I think uh, obviously we can learn from this experience. Uh, there are some concerns associated with chalk and other things, uh, drawing on sidewalks and buildings that John and I can discuss and we can review the policy, but at this time, uh, the policy is still no chalk. Okay. I appreciate that. Thus, maybe I would appreciate if you would speak to your workers as far as how they deal with the situation. Yes. Because he was very impolite and very rude to me and my son. Thank you. Very good. All right. Is this something that we can, um, is this something we can kind of open up, like, to everyone to discuss right now, or um, is that a possibility? Normally, when topics are brought up in public comment, since no one is prepared to discuss them, uh, we can bring it back for another agenda topic. We don't normally engage in dialogue on that particular topic until another meeting. Uh, so I would recommend that we put it back uh, on the agenda and we can have some, some conversation around why the policy is the way it is, and then we can communicate on how we propose to move forward. Was that if a committee member brought it up for discussion, then that was, um, you know, maybe not right at this moment, but perhaps later in this meeting? Normally, if we're posting meetings for discussion, we would want to post the agenda topic on the agenda to give the opportunity for community to be involved in the discussion. Uh, but if during reports you like to comment further on this, I'd leave it to the chair and vice chair to make that decision. Typically, thank you. Yeah, just typically, we have my short period here. It's worked a little bit better, Emily, to be able to have the staff ready to help help us have a conversation to go through this. So we've moved these to the. I have a long list of things on the agendas that uh, that uh, I'd love to talk about, but we've we've tried to bring those up at regular meetings so that the staff could be ready and that the public would have that opportunity to be able to uh, comment on it if they chose to do to as an agenda item. So that, that generally has worked better. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Steve. Very good. So now we're uh, to um, roles and authority of a high-functioning advisory uh, committee. And Kendall, this was your topic. And, and Jacob will be providing the presentation on that. Okay. Topic. I'll let Corey get all set up. Corey, if you could just click on that slide for me real quick, and then I should be able to... I'm gonna to have to ask you to advance slides. Okay. Um, so hi, my name's Jacob Wiley. I'm the city recorder. So you'll, my office is just upstairs. 
um, a little bit about my background. I went to uh, Gettysburg College for my bachelor's degree in German. Um, then I went to U of O for law school and OSU for a master's degree in water resources policy and management. So that's my background academics, the boring stuff. Um, but what I do is a city recorder. I'm the elections official, so I receive candidate applications and manage any of the election filings. Um, I'm also the agenda person for the city commission, so posting the agenda, <coughs> editing them, and getting them po like on the internet. I do a lot of the website stuff as well um, for you know agendas and minutes and those kinds of things. Um, I also kind of think of myself as the the in-house AV person as well, so I do a lot of AV. Uh, troubleshooting. It's just part of the job. Um, the other thing I do is uh, public records requests, so re records management, all that kind of where do we find it, where do we put it, documents. So for today, I'm here to talk about um, what makes, uh, how, how uh, boards and committees can be really effective. So for PRAC, how you can be the most useful and uh, for the city and for the public. And uh, the agenda kind of goes like this. Well, t what is the what does the city committee tick? Like, what are the fundamental documents that you know organize you as a committee? Um, roles, responsibilities, and policy development. So different uh, the different uh, you know components of the city and how they interact. Uh, public meeting laws and meeting management. So we actually just touched on one a little bit earlier today with that public comment with the item that was not on the agenda, but we wanted to talk about it. Um, there's a public meeting aspect to that. Um, so you tend to want to always post it, uh, the items on the agenda that you're gonna talk about, um, not only for the staff to prepare for that, but also so the public is aware. And so maybe there's other folks that wanted to come in and talk about sidewalk chalk, and they would have that opportunity to come in and talk about that. So it's, it's good for everyone, and it's the law. <laughs> uh, the other, the final thing would be being a member of a public committee. I'll go ahead and go to the next slide for me. So what makes a city committee, uh, city committee tick? So I'll ask Corey to click on that more button up there with the three dots and then go hide floating meeting controls down about, there you go. So what makes a city committee tick, um, kind of the layers, the Oregon city, the city charter is the fundamental document for the city. You probably, this is probably boring stuff. Oregon City City Code derives from the charter. So, you know, and there's a hierarchy there. The city code can't violate the charter. So you couldn't pass an ordinance that changes the charter. That's, that's just not how it works. Boards and Commission's Orientations Manual, that's adopted by res like a policy. Um, so that exists. It has a lot of, you know, good information about kind of what we're talking about today. Uh, then beyond that, you've got PRACs and bylaws. So those, you know, we're going from the broadest to the narrowest. So you've got your own bylaws. I encourage you all to take a look at those if you haven't in a while, uh, read through them. Um, those are typically revised every few years. So based on things changing in, the, in your organization or how you'd like running your meetings, things like that. Um, and Committees serve at the pleasure of the city commission. So for PRAC, they're, you're all appointed by the mayor after an interview process. Um, generally, you hold meetings, approve meeting minutes, um, follow one through six in your PRAC bylaws, which we actually will get to later in the meeting. And you vote on recommendations or advisory suggestions. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So I made this really complicated graphic to sort of talk about how the different groups and different people in our, in our organization interact. So the city commission is up there at the top and they kind of define the goals and policies and they're really the final authority in the city. The city manager is um, all of the department heads report to the city manager and the city manager reports to the city commission. So there's that structure there. Um, so that means the city manager's got a lot on his plate because he manages all of the directors and all of the things that the city does. Um, so the city manager's role is implementing policy, advising the city commission, and making recommendations for changes in policy at that level. Department directors uh, provide expertise in that specific area. So for transportation advisory committee, that would be um, John Lewis, who's a public works director. He's an expert on all of those things, public works. Um, Kendall here is our Parks and Rec director. He's an expert on Parks and Rec. 
So all of those expertise uh, give the city manager, you know, on-call experts on any given area. The role of the advisory committees is to help um, facilitate and guide the directors and, this, and funneling back up to the city manager to make good recommendations for policy for the city. So, uh, so the city commission, the direction and the priorities come down from the city commission and the input for finding policy and the expertise comes from the bottom. So you got uh, the, the PRAC is really the experts on the community's feelings about things. Um, they're the closest connection to the community that we have as, as an organization, um, other than just uh, random you know people coming in and talking to us. But you kind of are the representatives in that specific area for parks. Yeah, and it's an important connection to the community, and that's we thank you for your service. So the role of an advisory committee is uh, oh, those arrows are very hard to see on this on the projector, but there's a little circle that's going around. So the city commission defines the goals, creates policies, and then city staff takes that um, and carries out the policies and develops draft policies uh, based on their direction. The advisory committees are there to kind of refine those, build them, uh, review proposed projects and suggest improvements, really kind of drilling down and making it the best it can be. And then city staff takes that back. We gather more information and provide recommendations back up to the city commission. Um, so it's a citizen oversight and a public interest uh, value. Um, they help with policy suggestions. Um, yeah. So I guess what, a question for you all and there may or may not be a right answer to this. What do you think the purpose of the of PRAC is? Feel free to jump in. <laughs> well, it certainly, you've, you've stated it, it certainly is to uh, review and hopefully provide input uh, that uh, we're able to reach out to the broader uh, constituency to be able to help uh, the city commission make ultimately good decisions. Yeah. At least that's how I view it. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Anybody else? No, I think that's that's pretty much it. The uh, uh, policy suggestions, recommendations. Um, I'm not. I don't know that I am fond of the term citizen oversight, but because I don't think that that's really quite our role. But um, but I think certainly to help provide input and suggestions, solutions, those types of things. I think is yeah. definitely that. Mm -hmm. About getting uh, plans from the city staff and uh, seeing what we can do to put our input in it. Yeah, those are all great. Thank you. Let's go ahead and the next one. So, according to the bylaws, you have a purpose. Uh, it was to maintain, maintain active communication with the Parks and Rec Director and other relevant staff, provide recommendations to the City Commission relative to parks and, park, parks and Recreation, solicit citizen opinions relative to Parks and Rec. Request information from and consult with service organizations, special interest groups, neighborhood associations, and other professionals as appropriate. That's a long one. Oversee implementation of the Parks and Recreation Master Plan through periodic reviews, updates, and recommendations, and provide public meeting time for citizen input. So I, I kind of see your answers were right in line with what the bylaws say. Go ahead and the next one. So we'll get into the more boring stuff now. Oregon public meeting laws. Um, so this is kind of what we talked about just a second ago, public notice for all meetings. So you wanna have all of the subjects that you're going to talk about on the agenda so that everyone can know what's going on. Public meetings must be open to the public. So uh, the door's unlocked. Uh, minutes must be created for each meeting. So that's, those are just requirements, basic, basic stuff from Oregon law. Oh, well, next we'll talk about meeting management in this section. So effectively managing meetings. So the role of the chair, um, in our system, there's no special powers. It's not like there's a veto power given to the chair or anything like that. Um, one of that is actually, it's more restrictive in some ways because the chair cannot make a motion themselves. Um, they can second a motion, however. Um, they have to ensure that each member has an opportunity to speak. So go around the table, make sure everybody has their chance. Uh, keep the committee on task. So moving from the agenda to the next item um, without meandering too much. 
efficiently move through the agenda, like I just said, maintain decorum and intervene when necessary. So that it would be the role of the chair. Um, honestly, anyone could um, jump in if there was something going, you know, being mean, <laughs> basically. Um, that would be for anyone that's not the chair, it would be point of order. I don't think that this complies with our rules for decorum. So I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and also serves, uh, and the vice chair serves as the chair in the chair's absence. So how to make a motion. These are really basic things, so I'm sorry if it's a little bit of a snoozer. Um, you have discussion on the item. Then someone makes a motion that is not the chair typically. Someone seconds it. There's further debate, which is optional. Um, and this is, this is strictly following the Roberts Rules of Order. We don't follow them strictly, generally. Um, we're a little bit more informal in our committees. So. But that is the backup rule. If, if there's some kind of very important thing that needs to be pressed, we do fall back on the Roberts Rules of Order. Um, the chair can restate the motion if it's confusing. Um, sometimes it's like, I, I, I don't really know exactly what I'm seconding. Can we re-say re it again? So then, so it's clear for the record and it's clear for everyone else to what they're voting on. And then there's a vote. Um, the other common items, like I mentioned, was the point of order. Um, it's any time that you think something may be not going the way it should according to the bylaws. I mean, just say, I'd like to raise a point of order. I don't think that um, this is the right way we should be doing whatever it is. Um, the chair makes a ruling on that. Um, point will take in. Let's do what you said. Um, if it's not clear that the rule is violated in some way, you just decide as a group yourselves. So you would just say, decide, like make a motion to change or not change what we're doing. Um, one thing that's just a pet peeve of mine, often folks will say, you know what, let's call the question. That uh, usually is in reference to there's been, they're in that second further debate section up there at the top and they're just frustrated or tired or what you know what let's just call it let's make a vote the phrase call the question actually is itself a kind of motion in a way um and it's a pet peeve of mine so um really what you're saying is let's just vote um because when you say call the question it actually is itself a little it, it takes the motion and kind of sets it aside for a second and then you have a vote on to whether to vote and it takes two thirty, two thirds majority to pass. So you don't. Uh, it's a pet peeve. Don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. Appeal. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Do you have uh, cliff notes of Robert's rules that you could share with the committees or something? You know, to kind of because I mean, I doubt that most people are parliamentarians. You know, and it's just yeah. kind of one of those things that it's kind of awkward. I yeah. But is there a way to just you know provide a, uh, an abridged edition for or? or some rules on the back of the agendas and stuff so people understand that how we're going yeah, to... Yeah, I could definitely uh, make up something like that. I, I, mean, I, I don't want some resources. You know, if it's not super hard to do. Yeah, I don't... There's got to be... I don't have... Robert's right Rules for Dummies, isn't there, or something like that? <laughs> I, there, I'm sure there is, yes. Okay. <laughs> um, one organization that I would recommend, like, if you're interested, is called Jurassic Parliament. Um, it Literally, she uses dinosaurs as... Uh, uh, analogies for motions and things. It's pretty entertaining. So Jurassic Parliament um, is what I would refer you to. Okay. It's good stuff. Um, and the last one I want to bring up is an appeal. Um, so that's if the chair maybe is making a decision you don't like. Um, you can say, hey, I want to appeal that choice. So say like you're cutting someone off for public comment because they've been <laughs> going for six minutes and that's far too long. And uh, the chair says, no, we're, we're, you're done. It's been too long. Your, your time's up. And then maybe one of your other folks uh, on the committee doesn't like that and wants to hear it out. Say, like, you know what? I want to appeal the chair's decision on this. Um, not, that's also a point of order issue, too. So going too long can be a point of issue. Wanting to cut them off, you know, appealing the decision of the chair to cut them off. Um, but yeah, so that's uh, a motion and a second and a vote. So voting, there's two different kinds of voting. Um, earlier today, you did roll call to pass your minutes. 
There is another kind called acclamation. So that's probably what you've heard before in like television. All in favor say aye. Um, then they have to ask for the nays and the abstentions. Otherwise the vote is invalid because it's not finished. Um, that way, um, you know, if there was anyone that was voting no, <laughs> so, and that's a public meeting law records question. You have to have the meeting, the vote recorded. Um, if it's too hard to tell how many eyes and nays there were, you revert back to a roll call vote. The types of answers, A mean, uh, I means yes, nay means no, abstention counts as a no for voting purposes, but it's technically a non-vote. Conflicts of interest, this is probably not something that you need to worry about too much because you're an advisory committee and you're not making financial decisions. Conceivably, maybe someday PRAC might make a recommendation about grants. That could create a actual conflict of interest if you were the person receiving the grant. It could be a potential conflict of interest if say you were a member of the club that is receiving the money. So for a potential conflict of interest, you can still participate in the vote, but you have to state the conflict when it arises. And so you would say, today we're hearing, um, we're making a decision about awarding this grant um, to some club. You'd say, um, I would just like to say for the record that I have, um, I'm a member of this club, and, uh, but I'm not receiving the money directly. So that would be a potential, you can proceed to vote. Um, if you're an actual conflict of interest, you cannot participate in the discussion or vote. As in, you would need to stand up, go and sit in the public, like in the public area until the, the thing is over and then you could come back. So you can't even jump in to discuss or add information or any, nothing, nothing zilch. But this is very unlikely to be a thing you all need to worry about. I just wanna bring it up as, a, as a, an ethics thing. Another common question I get is about minutes. Yes, you can vote on minutes on meetings that you did not attend. So the analogy that I've uh, heard, and it might be a little clunky, it's like a train. PRAC is a train. People get on and off the train, but it still is a train, right? So the organization is what's approving the minutes, not the individual members. So if you miss a meeting, you can still vote on approving the minutes because and if you feel uh, hesitation about that, we have the video you can go back and watch to make sure you feel comfortable with it. But technically there is no reason that you have to abstain or vote no or anything like that. And being a member of a public committee. So being part of a committee, there's some things to keep in mind. The committee takes actions as a group and only as a group. Um, outside the committee, you can represent yourself and your own views but you can't say I'm a member of PRAC and PRAC doesn't support this. I bring it up, it's kind of a, something that's obvious, but I just wanna you know, emphasize some things and bring them up. Elected officials are democratically elected to determine the city's goals and desired outcomes. And this kind of goes back to what we were talking about before. Appointed officials assist them in improving and achieving the city commission's goals. Um, if you're personally passionate about a certain subject, you are more than welcome to express that to the city commission. Uh, but um, we staff and others, they have to follow what the city commission says through the city manager. So um, trying to think of an example, actually, that's kind of why I got stuck there for a second. Um, let's, let's imagine for some reason that you, uh, I am very, very passionate about beach balls. And I think that the city should buy lots of beach balls and provide them for free to people in the park. The city commission might not have included that in the budget. And so that's something you could go to them to say, hey, I think really think we should do beach balls in the park. But we're stuck with what we have right now for budget. So that, that's just a weird extreme example. So here's some just general government ethics rules that I wanted to go over. Um, there's no favoritism, obviously, no special privileges because of your position. Um, you wanna comp follow confidentiality rules and laws. Um, please don't steal from the city, either directly or on the side. Um, don't use your position to make money. No outside work that conflicts or interferes with your role here at, the, at PRAC. 
Uh, there are state law limits on accepting gifts. So you want to be careful of that. Um, yeah, it's kind of a little funny because it's like with your family and stuff, that's fine. Um, but if it's in the context of the city commission or of, of the city, then you want to be careful. And, and if you have any questions about that in the future, I'm, you can just give me a call and I can answer that. No personal use of city property, so please don't uh, take the park and rec truck uh, on a tour of the Oregon coast. Please don't do that. Um, and if you notice anything, um, please let us know and we'll, we'll deal with it. So I wanted to know if you guys have any questions or interesting takeaways or anything that was surprising. Yeah. Um, and it's a whole nother, probably a bigger issue, but don't we have a different role kind of around elections as well or not? Um, in what way? Well, I mean, there's, there's, you can't, I mean, as a committee, we can't really advocate. It was my understanding, I thought, that individually you can, but... Yeah, yeah, you want to be careful about that role, especially with elections. Um, you know, if there's a park bond measure or something like that, we have to be careful about how we we can address it individually. Mm -hmm. And and I think we could actually support it as a committee, but you can't... You, you can support it, but you can't advocate, I guess, and you can't use city resources yeah. to help advocate and city time and stuff. I think that's how I'm not that's sure. That's actually wanna... that's actually a really good question. Um, I I think I need to go back and carefully read those rules. Um, I know that that is true for staff and it is not true of elected officials, right. but appointed officials. That's a little bit unclear and I want to actually I'm going to look that up later and, and come back to you. But that that's a good it's a good question. I, I it would determine like if you're since you're citizen representatives, you're not staff and you're not paid. I don't think you would fall into that category, but I don't want to say that without yeah, checking. Yeah, it's kind of it's I know it's yeah, it's dicey, so. Mm -hmm. But I want to be clear though, if you're in your own on your own mm -hmm. as a citizen, you absolutely can have your own positions. So Definitely. as soon as I I take the jacket off and go outside, I can be in favor or not in favor of and vote and have an opinion, but we have a constitutional right. <laughs> when the camera's off. When the camera's off. <laughs> Daniel, let me ask you a question back to the, the public input mm -hmm. portion. Um, uh, came up first thing there in our meeting, but I'm looking at our, like our agenda this evening, mm -hmm. and we have a number of presentations and roles and authorities. So in my time here in the committee, I, I may be wrong, but I don't recall that we ever had any public speak or, or we didn't have the opportunity to have the public come in to speak to those presentations or the agenda items themselves. Now, maybe I'm wrong, but is that the place where the public would normally come in? We, we have this public comment piece, and it very clearly says, you know, listed items not listed on the agenda. Mm -hmm. But we haven't routinely, at least in my time, made it available for the public to speak to our presentation items. Is that is that where it should occur? So um, I don't remember. <clears throat> At the city commission level, we have comment cards that are um, people fill those out and hand them to the clerk before the meeting. And so that's at the point we would know if there's items they want to speak to on that are on the agenda. So this isn't it's not excluding them from speaking to those items. It's it's just that we want to <laughs> have that public comment during that items discussion. So if there, say, was somebody that wanted to discuss about the roles uh, for my presentation today, right. um, we would ask them to notify the clerk, and that way they can relay that to the chair, and the chair can say, before you get started, we, or, or you can ask the person, do you want to do your public comment before or after the presentation? Um, but they would do it then at that part of the agenda and not during the public comment period that you're referencing. So they would do it with the item. Just a follow up, and and that notification mm -hmm. um, could occur. I mean, we could have people walk in this evening yep. and want to speak to your presentation for mm -hmm. whatever reason, and that could occur here at the meeting rather than having to have the real advance notice. Uh, you know, to yeah. to well, in the in the in the three years I've been here, the requirement. I say requirement or the protocol mm -hmm. was to get it in uh, by 12 o'clock uh, the day of the meeting so right. we can communicate communicate that 
uh, we've never inhibited anybody who came in after that deadline per se. Uh, and normally in situations where the agenda has been posted or we get uh, requests to give public comment, they just email me uh, directly or, or Corey or whoever the administrative assistant is. And we notify the chair and vice chair during our, our meetings that, hey, we have these people who want to provide public comment on these topics. So you're aware. Uh, obviously, this is the very first in-person meeting right. that we've ever had since I've been here <laughs> for a crack. Uh, but yeah, um, we, we uh, try to facilitate public comment as much as possible. And just to clarify that, uh, sorry, um, it doesn't have to be on one of the agenda topics. It no. could be anything pertaining to Parks and Rec. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that would be a kind of public comment that goes in the public comment period at the beginning of the meeting? Right because it's not an item that's not on yep. the agenda. Yeah. Well, I, th I think that just, that's the challenge, I think, for we, we always, we're very uh, good about getting, you know, agendas and everything out for the public to see. But a lot of times it's been my experience having public come to meetings. They may not be set up to, you know, call you three days in advance and have thought about it all that much. It may be, oh, I saw this, it's on, that's right, it's tonight at six o'clock. I'd like to come in and speak on that agenda item, mm -hmm. and uh, um, we I hope we facilitate a way to occasionally do that for people. I mean, I realize the protocol is a little bit different, but but some public may not be quite attuned to the process to be able to do it that far in advance. Can we address that in the bylaws, maybe? Yes. Yeah, that's the that's the right place for that kind of a question because it would be specific to this committee in that way. I guess the important thing is to probably emphasize over and over that we are only an advisory role, so input to us is 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 going to help us make some uh, you know some kind of advice provided. So we're not a decision maker, and one the one. Mm -hmm danger you sometimes get into I always worry about it you, these meetings might get pretty darn long if we're not careful on some subjects <laughs> so we just have to be sure that we emphasize that we are an advisor role not a decision maker and I think that would help with, with how much you know yeah minutes is really the one real thing you get to decide yeah. <laughs> yeah. other the rest of it's mostly recommendations Was there any interesting things that you learned, something you didn't know about? Anything you want to uh, make sure I bring up the next time I do this? <laughs> that was very good. Thank you. Yeah, I, th I think if you just maybe send us a blurb about the election thing just to make sure we're not... Accidentally getting in trouble, yeah. No, that's a really good question. I'm going to have to figure that out. Thank you. All right, well, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Have a good rest of your meeting. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, moving on to the next item on the agenda is the Peace Tree Dedication and Arbor Day event. And Pete's gonna talk. Hi, thanks. It's a pleasure to be before you tonight. Um, I'm sitting in for Molly Garan, our assistant planner. Um, so planning staff is here uh, because we're involved with trees and there's some overlap between the Natural Resources Committee, which I staff, and PRAC. Um, so I'm here tonight just to talk about two of three events. Um, um, the first uh, event I wanted to raise awareness about is uh, Arbor Day, which is April 1st. Um, there are going to be two events. One is going on down at the end of the Oregon Trail Interpretive Center, which is um, Oregon City Enhancement Day. Um, but I'm not here to talk about that. Um, that will be an Arbor Day event as well. Um, there's also a Friends of Trees uh, planting event, which is the staging area will be at Chapin Park, but they will be going out from Chapin Park to plant trees in the neighborhoods in the south side of the city. Um, and they anticipate planting about 100 trees. Um, that event, oh, could you? Let's see, advance that slide. 
Uh, next slide, yeah. Um, is uh, going to be at 8.45 to 1 p.m. at Chapin Park. Um, folks can re register to participate in the planting event via the uh, Friends of Trees website. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is a screenshot of Friends of Trees event calendar, which the uh, website is at the bottom left here um, and you can click on the links there to both participate and sign up to participate. You have to sign a waiver form. You can also uh, sign up to get a tree still. So if you're interested in getting a tree, which at a very low cost and a very high quality, because Friends of Trees sources their trees from nurseries and selects good stock, um, then uh, goes out and uh, plants those in, in front of your house or in your yard. Um, so that's going on. Um, Friends of Trees program has been supported with the city's tree mitigation fund, which is a, a fund that is uh, funded by developments that can't plant all the trees that they are required to plant on site so they can pay money per tree into this fund and planning has a contract with Friends of Trees to subsidize this program. So uh, that's how that program runs and it runs year to year with Friends of Trees. Um, and it's been successful. Um, they do a lot of the work that our planning division can't do and the other departments can't do because public works, parks and uh, uh, planning all share responsibility for management of Oregon City's urban forest. Um, and uh, planning's mostly regulatory, but um, this has been something that we just help with throughout the years. So um, I'm mostly here just tonight to raise awareness about this, uh, at this particular event, and the next event, which um, I think you guys have already discussed. Uh, basically, um, I wanted to give a little more context um, because the slides here don't have a lot of information about the Hiroshima Peace Tree Dedication Ceremony, um, which is going to be on April 29th at the end of the Oregon Trail. But um, here's, here's a little more background. So from 2019 through 2022, uh, 34 communities in Oregon planted a total of 51 Hiroshima peace trees, which are the progeny of Hibaku Jumoku, trees that survived the atomic bombing of Hiroshima, Japan. And as part of the United Nations Green Legacy Hiroshima Project, communities all across the globe planted the trees as a reminder of the horrors of nuclear war and as a symbol of the resilience of humankind and the natural world. And the seeds were collected by affiliate members of that program and then germinated and distributed it to communities in Oregon and other states through a partnership with the One Sunny Day Initiative, the Oregon Department of Forestry and Oregon Community Trees. So that's a little background on this. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the event will be at the EOT or end of the Oregon Trail Interpretive Center from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Um, there will be speakers, including uh, uh, representatives from the uh, Department of Forestry, Oregon Community Trees, and we're still planning for um, some additional uh, speakers to come. So further details will be provided closer to the event. Um, people can RSVP by emailing ocplanning at orcity.org. It is open to the public and we really look forward to as many people participating as possible. Um, the tree uh, had been uh, part of their part of the uh, process of recognition of the Hiroshima peace tree as a dedication ceremony, which had been planned, but because of COVID couldn't, couldn't happen. And so that's what's happening now. And so planning's just helping out raising awareness with that um, and with working with parks on that. Do you guys have anything to add on, on that one? Okay. Yep. So the location of the, uh, of the tree is, uh, it's uh, it's over on the uh, 
let's see, the southern side of the uh, EOT, and there will be, um, but we'll be uh, kind of congregating there and then uh, walking to the, the site. And so um, that's all I have. Next slide, I think, oh yeah, this is uh, some of the uh, partners, and that includes One Sunny Day Initiative, uh, the various Oregon City departments, Oregon City, community trees and uh, the interpretive center and the library staff. So uh, looking forward to, to uh, in, in a participant. If you can come, that would be great. Thank you. Very good. Um, any, Pete, any questions? Um, so for the tree program that you have, uh, the Arbor yeah. Day event, mm -hmm. Are these trees the, that are supposed to be in the curb uh, in the boulevards of houses? It started out that way that they were mostly going to be planted in planter strips in front of people's houses. And, you know, that's a street tree. Um, it's the responsibility of a budding property owner to maintain and replace. Um, and But sometimes there isn't room or sometimes the property owner would prefer that the tree not be in the planter strip, but also be in their front yard. So we're being much more flexible now than we used to be and saying, yeah, as long as a tree gets planted, we really don't care where it goes. You know, as long as it's observing certain spacing from public infrastructure and Friends of Trees is already marking out the sites ahead of time uh, and know what our spacing requirements are and that kind of thing. So uh, they also have uh, a lot of different species that aren't necessarily on the city's recommended street tree list, but they are all uh, certified arborists who are out there helping. And so our code says, if you have a species of tree that isn't on our list, but is recommended for that area from the certified arborist, we will we'll approve it. So that they have uh, you know different varieties and different stock and that kind of thing. Yeah. And all the trees have been vetted so they don't push up concrete. Well, there's never any guarantee of that, um, but they certainly select trees based on right tree, right place philosophy. Um, uh, owners, if they want to, can uh, place a root barrier adjacent to the sidewalk or and adjacent to the curb. Uh, I will say that the last planning that we did uh, up in Park Place and various other neighborhoods, but um, they were replacing trees that had lifted sidewalks and they were coming back with trees that grow a lot smaller. Um, and they were things like uh, uh, Japanese snowbell, um, you know, species that don't have the root system that the red maples did that caused the problems. So while there's never any guarantee, choosing a smaller and slower growing tree uh, with a less robust root system that is, you know, suited to the soil as well is uh, added insurance. And so, and uh, related to that, we have, uh, we are going through a process right now at the city commission to adopt a uh, slight amendment to our street tree code that uh, allows people not to have to replace trees in planter strips that are three foot or less in width. Um, so it hasn't been adopted yet, but it's been a sort of a working policy that we've had for a long time and now is, will be codified. And we also adopted an updated street tree list last year with a, which kind of weeded out some problem species because they either dropped hard fruit, which created potential for rolling underfoot um, or were messy and that kind of thing. So. Um, we're a lot more cognizant of the potential for sidewalk lifting and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, that's why the street tree list was amended as well. So, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I'm, I'm making an assumption, but I, but I think it's an important one, and that is that all of these events probably go apply towards the Tree City USA designation and that's, that. which is kind of a, that's just kind of cool and the basis of the whole program. Right. Any event that Oregon City does uh, with respect to trees counts towards our Tree City USA program. And that's um, what, yeah. 10, 11? 11 years 11 now. years this yeah, year? We yeah, we just got our recognition for our 11th year. Nice. Um, and yeah, that is, uh, uh, it's, it's great. Obviously, Oregon City's
been managing trees and doing the sorts of things that our Tree City USA needs to do for a long time, but it's nice to get the recognition every year. Exactly. So the annual application goes through the uh, Arbor Day Foundation. And then uh, I should just mention what the four requirements are to be a Tree City USA. Um, you have to have a tree board. In that case, this the Natural Resources Committee serves as our tree committee in their bylaws. Um, you have to have a public tree ordinance. Um, you have to observe Arbor Day, and you have to spend at least $2 per capita on tree management. Those are the four criteria. And we've always exceeded those requirements. So. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, the next item on the agenda is Daughters of the American Revolution Never Forget Garden Proposal. Hi, uh, I'm Julianne Smith. I'm the uh, regent for the local chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution, the Susanna Lee Barlow chapter. And I'd like to thank the committee for um, allowing me to make my presentation um, to you all. Um, so the, um, is this the first slide? Yes. Okay. Um, what is the Never Forget Garden? Um, well, it was initiated in 2018 by the Society of the Honor Guard and Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. And what it involves is the planting of gardens as a visual representation of America's commitment to recognize, remember, and honor our veterans. And it's a, a way of expressing our patriotism, love, mourning, and remembrance. And it um, allows people to have a place to go to to reflect and remember the sacrifice made by our veterans and their families. The essential elements um, of the Never Forget Garden include a site, um, an American flag, a bench upon which to sit and reflect, a marker that you can see here in this um, slide, this Never Forget Garden marker, a chapter <coughs> plaque um, that just shows who created um, the garden, um, the only required floral element of the garden is a white rose. And then, of course, you can have other uh, flowers as well. And then, of course, once the um, garden is in place, a dedication ceremony would be held. So our um, chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution has been uh, looking for a good site for this type of garden because we would li really like to do something to um, remember our veterans. And, you know, we're, we've been looking for a site that is uh, publicly accessible and would support having this type of garden. And it's a plus, of course, to have a place that already has a flag and a bench in place. So that uh, brought us to look closely at Jacobs Memorial Square. And you can see in the picture here, there's the flag pole and um, a bench already in place. And it is in an area that um, is very easily accessible to the public. So um, this garden uh, would honor veterans from all generations. Um, the marker and the accompanying flowers we feel would enha enhance and add further interest uh, to the existing site. It's in a high visibility location adjacent to the senior center, uh, library and street, which um, allows for easy accessibility for um, seniors, library and museum visitors library and museum visitors and the community in general. <coughs> Excuse me. And it would be, you know, um, <coughs> excuse me, a nice fo focal point to educate visitors and provoke thoughtfulness. <coughs> I'm sorry, I've been having a lot of trouble with me and having a lot of laryngitis recently. Um, it would provide a place for remembrance and a, <coughs> a place to express gratitude. 
hunt and would fulfill the purpose outlined by those who dedicated the block to the city, which is for the education and our civic purposes of the residents of the city. <coughs> Excuse me. So, <coughs> do you want to have a drink and step out and then we can just chat for a moment? I already did. <laughs> I'm taking a cough drop right now. Thank you, though. <coughs> Sometimes it's so hard when you get like a like a little bit of like dust in your throat or something. It's kind of yeah, it's yeah hard to catch your breath. A going on for two weeks now. <coughs> so as I mentioned, this site we feel is ideal because it does offer a space for a garden to be developed. The American flag is already there. There's a bench there. We already have the marker. We need to, of course, um, get a chapter plaque and then the flowers for the garden. Um, this is a close-up view of the site that we were specifically thinking of. The area that is circled in red was a spot that we had thought uh, we could put the plaque and then um, we would need to find exactly where in that plot of land would be a good location for the garden. Um, our committee uh, previously met with um, Jonathan and, you know, ultimately we would probably lean on you somewhat to provide your thoughts as to where the ideal spot would be for the actual plants. Um, and then once all of this has been figured out and approved, and then uh, we would hold a dedication ceremony. Um, so our next steps, if I'm understanding the process correctly, uh, would be uh, to seek input and approval from your committee, um, and then the creation of a memorandum of understanding. Um, our chapter would provide the flowers, um, the marker, the plaque, um, we can do the planting uh, with guidance, of course, as to where we should plant. And uh, we can also provide uh, replacement of flowers and marker as needed, um, in addition to uh, maintenance if necessary. And that's about all I have. And um, Julianne, I'm so sorry, but I do believe that um, I had a that were cut off, so that's okay. This might that's be why the I one asked. That I know. And I apologize. <laughs> like, oh, I guess I'm not. I look back. Anything. I'm like, well, let me see what they sent me. I'm not sure why only a select few, but I don't know if you want to go over this. And oh, that's okay. This should be pretty quick. Um, just some background on who the daughters of the American Revolution are. We're an organization that's nonprofit, uh, non-political, made up of volunteers. It's a women's service organization founded in 1890, and um, members are those uh, women who can prove lineal descent from a patriot of the American Revolution. And our um, focus is to promote historical preservation, education, and patriotism. And we do this by supporting and assisting uh, soldiers who are on active duty, as well as veterans, we provide um, awards and um, financial aid um, scholarships. We help uh, restore and maintain historical sites. And then, of course, place memorials um, to people and events similar to what we're talking about today. And that might have been the only slide that was missing. <laughs> yeah, I apologize. <laughs> so um, thank you again for your attention. Um, are there any questions that I might be able to answer? Well, thanks for your presentation. Um, John, is there any irrigation close by at this site? Um, there is irrigation at the Pioneer Center, um, not in that section, um, around the edges and everything like that. There is though, so, mm -hmm. yeah. So it shouldn't be a problem to water it, is what you're saying? It would not be a problem to have water to that area. Okay. No. All right. I had a question for staff too, I guess. Um, are you not aware of any 
conflicts and any de deed restrictions or anything that created Jacob's Square that this would. Well, that's where is a it's a remembrance area for them. And there, there is a plaque with some information right. that that family donated that block for exclusively um, or is it? No, is it, it's I like I think multi purposing areas is is great. Yeah, so, it was for recreation and civic purposes. So the whole block was. So this would fit within that. It absolutely would. And John walked that area with me, and and that particular area, we would love to have this group um, do some beautification and give it a purpose because mm -hmm. uh, you've got those boulders with the plaque on it of the dedication of the the land, and then um, John's worked really hard to clean that corner up because it had. The plant material had grown pretty large and it became an area that was kind of hidden for um, overnight camping and, and drug use, basically. So he's cleaned that area up so that people can use those benches. And it's been used appropriately, but it really could use um, some beautification and a, an additional purpose. That's always really nice. Thanks. Emily, did you have something to add? <clears throat> yeah, I just... Um... I don't know if you mentioned this already and I just missed it. Um, it cut out for a second. But um, what is like the total like square footage of the garden that you're wanting to put in? You know, it can be really any size. It can be as small okay. as it needs to be. You know, the most essential element is the white rose, which that really wouldn't take up too much room. Okay, Kendall. What is, I guess, like the, the maximum? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't really thought about that. <laughs> um, okay, sorry. I, I, I don't imagine. Yeah, you know, like anywhere between a white rose and. <laughs> And well, like, there's already existing landscape there as well. So, I mean, we'll, we'll work to. Okay. Yeah. So, so, it would be fair to say you could probably incorporate something like this into the existing structures. Yeah, I mean, it may require us to move some flower bulbs or something along those lines, sure. but. But it's something that, that can manage. incorporate without too much uh, extra, extra work. Yep. Kendall, what is the process here as far as discussion among the committee versus uh, getting something going? Yeah, so we're looking for direction from PRAC that this is something that you support and that you would like for us to, to move it forward. So uh, we would request that there be some type of motion, either direction, if you support it or you don't support it, and that there be some type of vote on, uh, on that moving forward. I think that this would be a great color spot in that uh, area. Uh, Oregon City always needs more flowers, and uh, especially in an area that the senior citizens gather in regularly and pass by, and uh, such a public spot. So um, does anybody want to create a motion for this? I'll give it a try. How about that? Okay. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I would make a motion that we uh, support uh, the Never Forget Garden proposal that we had presented here this evening. Uh, again, support that proposal and uh, continue the discussions uh, of co coordination between the city and uh, the uh, Daughters of American Revolution to put that in place consistent with what the needs of the city are as well. We, uh, so do we have a, uh, a discussion on this? Uh, you got to have a second first. Oh, good. okay. Oh, you got a second. Oh, you did. Okay, yes. sorry. Okay. Okay. We have uh, a motion to go ahead and uh, approve the uh, Daughters of the Revolution um, Never Forget Garden in, uh, in the Senior Center lot and that we should support city staff to get things moving to uh, get it established. So um, do we have any further discussion on that? No. So um, we we'll go to a vote. Roll call? Yeah. <laughs> Ken Worcester? Yes. Joey Knopf? Yes. Tim West? Yes. Steve Williams? Yes. Tim Lanehart? Yes. And Emily Lisborg? 
Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Very good. So we'll look okay. forward to a nice color spot right there at the senior center. Great. Thank you so much. I appreciate well, your thank attention. You. Thank and you. thank you, Emily, for your concern about my little choking episode. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, there's so much going around right now. Yeah. So sympathize. So then, Jonathan, I guess we'll just talk to you about the next step. So. Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving right along. The next item is movies in the park. Ah, so good evening, Park and Rec Advisory Committee. I'm Melissa Sebastian, the Aquatic and Recreation Manager, and I have the privilege of working alongside a team that gets to put on movies in the park every summer. Um, we do movies in the park on the first four Fridays of August. We rotate between different parks each summer. And every year we come to Prac to show you essentially a list of movies that we have put out to the public to vote on. And out of this list of 14 movies, we will take the top four movies with the highest votes and play those. But part of what we like to do is get your input on them and make sure that there's not a movie on this list that you may you know, think might be inappropriate to show to the community or may have concerns about us showing it. And this is essentially your opportunity to provide either that input or provide support with this list moving forward. And that's essentially what I have. I don't see anything too offensive there. <laughs> One thing I do notice, uh, it's a great movie, but Top Gun does have a, a pretty explicit sex scene in it. Mm -hmm. So it, for all ages, I don't know how appropriate that would be. Okay. Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't know all of these movies, but uh, most of them that are here, uh, I've seen, I think, with my grandkids and some of my kids as well. So uh, I think there's some, there's some ones I like better than others, but it doesn't really matter at this point. So I don't, I don't see anything there that's, uh, that would offend me in any way. Awesome. Yeah, and you guys all have opportunity to go and vote for which ones you want on there, too. It's open for another few weeks. All right. Very good. I, I'm pretty sure I can sing you all of the, the Frozen <laughs> from, uh, that I've heard from Angel. Yeah, <laughs> Please spare us. No, no, you want me to prove it. You want me to prove it. Yeah. All right. Great. Awesome. Any other? Awesome. Thank other you. Comments on the movies. Thank you. So we're to uh, general business and staff reports. Here's where you guys get to take over. So I'll kick things off. Uh, so as you know, uh, we have a, a very somber announcement. Kathy Wiseman Stop. will be leaving us uh, March 31st. Uh, she will be retiring uh, from Oregon City. Um, Kathy's been here for 19 years. Uh, she's been responsible for turning around the senior center uh, and all the, the programming uh, that we currently have. Uh, she's been dedicated to this community and has had a tremendous impact on the lives of people in this community. Uh, I don't know if she'll let us but we would like to celebrate her at some point next week uh, and uh, celebrate her time with Oregon City. But this will be her last meeting with us. So, Kathy, do you have anything you'd like to say? Well, you made me come in person, so I decided to quit. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can just give an update when it's my turn. Okay. All right. Um, uh, other information with Kathy's retirement, uh, we have started the recruitment process uh, for a new manager at that location. Uh, we uh, are going to be doing our first round of interviews on Friday, on March 31st. Um, our goal is to uh, move the process forward and uh, to find the right person for that uh, facility moving forward and hopefully have someone in place in the next four to six weeks. Uh, another announcement, and this one's uh, particularly for Steve. 
He's been asking uh, ever since he became a member, is there an update on Sportscraft? <laughs> so I am proud to announce that we did uh, get the Sportscraft license agreement approved on March 15th. Uh, almost two years mm -hmm. of negotiations, uh, but that license agreement did get approved. That license agreement runs from uh, July 1st of 2021 uh, to November 30th of 2024. Um, it addresses uh, the, the rate, it addresses restroom access, maintenance, safety issues, insurance, a lot of things that should have been addressed uh, early on that weren't addressed in the, the previous license agreement. Uh, so we look forward to continuing to, to work with the Dye family and continue that relationship. But proud to announce we finally got it done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kendall, for uh, uh, bringing that to kind of conclusion uh, to us. Just one question, when I noted the, the the November 30, 2024 date. Um, it's been my experience, usually those kinds of agreements are a little bit longer than that. Um, I understand some of the difficulties bringing that all together, but but that seemed a little unusually short term given what, what goes on down there and kind of the commitments. Anything you can fill us in on there? Well, there was a lot of back and forth on the on the length uh, of the license agreement. Um, and I'll say that I t have to take direction from the city commission in regards to the terms of the agreement. Mm -hmm. uh, we felt like uh, this would give us the opportunity to reset the relationship with the Dye family and to um, work together uh, moving forward in a positive direction. Uh, and, and hopefully in the future, there might be an opportunity uh, for an even longer agreement. Okay. Are there any uh, requirements for improving the docks, their facility? There, there were some safety concerns that were addressed in the license agreement with the docks. There's also a requirement for a master plan uh, to highlight uh, some of the things that need to happen in regards to improvements for the property uh, that are in the license agreement that we will uh, continue to have those conversations with the Dye family on things that need to do, they need to do moving forward and improvements they need to make. Uh, but uh, we're both com committed to, to working with them to make those improvements to the property and the Dyes are receptive to that as well. If I recall correctly, there there may be some uh, some fairly significant changes to one end of the dock structure there as a result of the the, I the highway project. Yeah, yes. Thankfully, some loss of yep. of structures there that mm -hmm. uh, I'm assuming uh, probably plays into this somehow yes. in terms of what they have to do. There, there, there were conversations around the condemnation proceeds, which was referenced. Um, in the staff report uh, and basically that involves uh, a payout to the Dye family in regards to the impact that the removal of those docks has on their property. Uh, but all of that was addressed in the license agreement and there's, there's money that they would get access to based on right. the execution of this agreement associated right. with that. Well, I just want to say I'm glad that I've been able to reach an agreement there. It's a, you know, that 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 whole operation there is a, is an important piece of the puzzle in terms of activities and and the ability to utilize the river at that location. I think there's some there's still some challenges I suspect to be met there, uh, particularly in line to some of the improvements you might have mentioned that uh, that probably should occur to, you know, uh, make things a bit. Uh, frankly, a bit better looking, if you will, compared to what they've been over the last few years. I think that's an important piece, but uh, I appreciate and thank you for staying as diligent to give me Other announcements, uh, we, for the parks master plan, uh, we did meet with the consultants this week and we finalized uh, the level of service information, benchmarking. We are currently working on park funding uh, and so we have scheduled 
discussions around park funding. And then I think it's uh, June is when we will be coming back with a draft of a comprehensive plan uh, to share uh, with PRAC, the community, city commission uh, to get some additional feedback. Uh, other things, uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, of, there's been a lot of discussion around park fees and memorandums of understanding. Uh, we have another work session coming up uh, next month on the 11th, which is a Tuesday at 6 p.m. to continue uh, that conversation. Uh, we'll definitely make sure that that information is available to all of you if you like to attend and participate in uh, that meeting. Uh, but uh, we hope to bring this information to the city commission and hopefully have a resolution. Uh, April 27th, uh, it's a big day. Uh, we do have a, a PRAC meeting schedule, but uh, we have our first budget committee meeting scheduled the same day. Uh, so uh, we will need to cancel that meeting on the 27th. Um, we would like support for, from all of you. Uh, during those budget committee meetings, we have several planned uh, in uh, one in April, several in May, uh, if it needs additional days. Uh, it will share uh, what our proposed budget will be, um, and there will be discussions around that moving forward uh, with the budget committee and city commissioners. Is there anything that the Park and Rec's advisory committee could do to uh, lobby the commission to increase funding for the parks if uh, you <laughs> desperately need? That's, that's, that's a loaded question, dude. <laughs> We're being filmed. <laughs> Jacob, share with you, you are advocates. Uh, I would encourage you to uh, help tell our story in regards to our funding. Um, I think uh, the Parks and Recreation Department has been underfunded for quite some time and we've been operating uh, at a deficit. Uh, I, we've shared uh, over the past several years, we've added three additional parks, uh, which is great for the community but we didn't get any additional staff. We didn't get any additional maintenance. Uh, we have $23 million worth of deferred maintenance that incorporates our parks and our facilities. Um, and we want to continue to provide these services at a high level, but we need support, not just from, from you, but the entire community uh, to help guide the conversation in that direction to make sure that we do have the support that we need uh, so we can continue to serve the community at a high level. Mm -hmm. So um, I'd be happy to share some information with you in regards to uh, what are some of our goals moving forward. Um, as you're aware, uh, the Clackamas Park Master Plan, which was something else that I uh, was going to provi provide an update on, um, the boat ramp alone the cost associated with that is scheduled to be $1.5 million. That's just the boat ramp. Uh, that project is projected to cost about 14 to $15 million to completely uh, develop uh, that, that, that park. So uh, there's a lot of need, um, but we don't have a lot of funding to, to fulfill that need. Okay. So. Um, Yes, we would love to have support from, from PRAC uh, and helping to advocate for us. Um, the goal also with the Parks Master Plan is to provide some recommendations in regards to funding uh, and some direction on that and what the recommendations uh, the consultants have for, for moving forward to address some of that need, whether it be a bond or levy, utility fees, um, we're going to incorporate those recommendations in the parks master plan as well. Uh, and hopefully we can garner enough support to move those conversations forward to get the funding uh, that we need. Are you guys on a biennial budget? Yes. Okay. And then do you also adopt a CIP at the same time? We're going to we, defer we, that. I mean, you're going to have to, you're probably going to 
miss we're gonna the miss cycle that. for yeah. the master yeah. plan. Yeah. So you probably, do you have like an interim CIP that you're gonna- We, we have propose? a CIP plan that we currently are working off of. Um, my, my hope is with, obviously with the parks master plan, we'll have a new CIP right. and then the other part of the master planning process is looking at the methodology for our SDCs. Good. So we're, we're starting to have those conversations to start working on that as well so we can tie those together. It would, if you don't mind, would, could you just share the, the proposed uh, capital projects with us before, you, before those hearings start so that we know what we're... Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Kendall, in an effort to help us help you, um, I used to utilize in my previous life, uh, we would develop white papers uh, it, when I was working for the state. We were not allowed to lobby, mm -hmm. uh, just as you were not. But we were able to put together, if you call them talking points or whatever you want to call them, just in like one page documents that we used to provide our Fish and Wildlife Commissioners at the time, mm -hmm. and then they could go lobby uh, from those talking points. And it wasn't against any any rules and it gave them then something to kind of speak from and they could embellish or do whatever they wanted to do from there but uh if there's anything like that that you're at liberty to be able to kind of just one page no mm -hmm. no more but so we've got maybe your major talking points maybe areas of critical need or whatever something we can talk from it makes it a lot easier to go lobby for it mm -hmm. frankly if you've got something like that in your pocket sure. and one more question. <laughs> Where is the boat ramp, the Clackamas Park boat ramp in the uh, Marine Board's uh, five-year plan? Is that, I think it's a high priority with the Marine Board, isn't it? it? it I, I think it is a high priority with the Marine Board. They wanted a, an answer five, what, five years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been the ones that, that have held up this decision. Sure. So they're actually waiting until we get the, the master plan adopted and uh, John and Denise have already started having conversations with the Marine Board uh, and then we plan to, to move forward with looking at permitting and construction. Granting. Yeah. I, I believe they had some work that they were planning to do in advance of the final, so you say, location of that with some of their hydrolo hydrology uh, work. They wanted to do a, a re uh, reevaluation of the original hydrologic work they did there because the way that river changed yeah it'll it'll most likely require a new hydrology study yeah. so because i think that's their response well they said they would do it that's i believe it's, what i heard yeah yeah <laughs> yeah it's all part of you probably will have a couple different grants yeah. um one to do the studies and then one to get into the construction and more than likely odf and w will actually be the primary funder Funneling it through the Marine Board. Do you have any preliminary designs of what that uh, boat launch is going to look like? Uh, the, just the information that we sh had shared with you during the master planning process. And Kendall, I'll just add again, as I did during that whole process, that as you get, as the city gets closer to putting that kind of design on the on the on paper and on the ground, I would hope that we would uh, solicit some input from people who use boat ramps and are familiar with with how to launch a boat and move a boat around in a in a situation so that we don't end up you know building something that is not usable. Right. Yeah. Um, and that concludes my update. So I'll turn it over to John. Good evening. Um, I just have a few quick points. Um, Pete was here and he spoke about uh, the Friends of Tree Planting that will be occurring on April 1st. Um, I will not be at Chapin Park for the Friends of Tree Planting because I will be at the end of the Oregon Trail for the Oregon City Enhancement Day. So that's what the um, he, he was describing is that uh, the planning department will be heading up the Friends of Tree Planting, and we will be plant, uh, plant, heading up the planting at the end of the Oregon Trail, Saturday, April 1st, 9 a.m. to noon. Um, and then we're just asking that uh, volunteers uh, go online. They can um, uh, sign up 
uh, or email for information at parksinfo at orcity.org or call uh, our offices if they have any questions. Um, secondly, he'd also mentioned the peace tree uh, dedication, which um, some of the folks um, that are still on PRAC were involved in some of the conversations, but um, in, in a lot of senses, we're doing a lot of work in preparation um, for that uh, dedication, the day of dedication for the peace tree. So um, you might see some work going on down at the end of the Oregon Trail for that. Um, also, the flagpole was delivered for us to um, start getting that installed for um, the Veterans Memorial at Mountain View Cemetery. And um, that's in preparation of our Memorial Day event that we host up there at Mountain View Cemetery. And then also, um, we began to receive uh, the dates that the uh, teddy bear parade will be May 6th. So, um, and that, of course, um, ends, the parade ends down at uh, Clackamas Park. So, uh, just a little bit of information for you guys. All right, Denise. So, just a couple updates. Um, West Good Neighbor Agreement. We did the project down at River Access this last year. We're going to continue to do some work down at River Access, and we put our proposal forward to the West representatives on Tuesday, and um, they approve of our project proposals, which would be to continue some of the hazard limb removals since we're still dealing with the effects of the ice storm, some of the delayed effects of the ice storm. So we have some uh, hazard tree limb removals, as well as um, since our last time going through the limbs and limb removals and tree removals for dead trees, we have since um, acquired some new dead trees, cottonwoods, um, along the trail area that we'll take out as well. The asphalt path we did not work on. Um, we did the concrete pathway area. So we're going to transition into the asphalt pathway and we have some heaving from the roots from cottonwoods. So we'll address some of those trip hazards um, in this next, uh, it'll be the first year of our biennium. Then we're going to work on some plantings along the parking lot hillside and shore up that hillside a little bit more as well as uh, install some trees in the beauty strip that's along that um, kind of the parking, the parallel parking that we added the parallel hashing to for the parking area. And then we'll be putting in some irrigation into those areas as well. Um, we're gonna keep those plantings low profile so that there's still visibility from Washington Street into the parking lot since we don't care for the smash and grabs. So if we can keep the visibility, um, that's what we're intending to do down there. Um, on the second year of our biennium, along with the Clackamas master plan, we're targeting areas of the permitting, construction documents, hydrology study for the boat ramp, and getting some of that rolling so we can leverage some of the um, West Good Neighbor Fund grant, or West Good Neighbor Agreement funds towards grants. Um, because we do know that those are general fund items. Those are existing things within our park structure. We can't use SDCs or, so it would be, our SDCs are limited to what we can use those for is a new improvement or something that wasn't in the park. Um, but then grant funds are typically what we try and leverage, but with our general fund being light, these West Good Neighbor Agreement funds will help us in those general fund areas to get things rolling. Um, the cemetery restroom replacement demo has been initiated. We're about 90% done with the main shop structure that we're removing, the existing shop structure we were removing, and about, I'd say 30% of the restroom. <coughs> we are running into our very first delay PG was going to come out today. Um, unfortunately, they had a sick crew, so we will be rescheduling that. The delay comes with, we were looking to remove the power and then we could take down our remaining wall, which is our, about our 10% portion, our wall and our slab 
for that shop. Um, so we are just gonna have to wait a little bit until we can get a rescheduled date for PG to come out. They're gonna remove our service and then put a temp service in for us. Um, and then once that's done, then we can take down the remainder of the restroom, the remainder of the wall to the shop and the slab, and then we'll get moving. We do have um, two, F two RFIs in that we're getting answers to, and then we'll find out if there's any change orders that will occur based on those RFIs, on the answers to the RFIs. So that's about it. All right, Melissa? So um, we are in spring and just wrapped up summer or winter. We're heading into summer. I guess we're getting ready for all the seasons. <laughs> wrapping up for all the seasons. There's a lot of winter out here right now. Oh, yeah. I know. I heard that there's supposed to be snow somewhere Possible. on Saturday. Yeah. So um, we are... Um, I wanted to make sure to mention swimming lessons because I know that's something that's been brought up a lot. So we are at full operations for our swim lesson programs, which is great, but we're still not meeting the needs with the pool space that we have. So we are only right now with the amount of kids that we have registered and that we wrapped up meeting about 41% of what people are trying to request for swimming lessons. And part of that is, you know, the amount of pool space we have and all those after school programs that we're balancing. We host four different swim teams. We have open family swims, recreation swims, water exercise, and there's only, you know, so much space. So that's something that I wanted to mention that we are at full operations. Um, we do have full staffing, but we're still you know, just missing that mark just based off of the capacity that we have. Um, we're preparing for hiring for summer. So we're posting hopefully next week our positions for um, recreation leaders and a recreation lead position that'll help assist with our camps and special events this summer. And then we're wrapping up um, securing all of our sponsors for the concerts in the park and movies in the park. Uh, we just have a few more spots to fill on that. And next week we've got spring break camps and those are full and we're ready for those. And then we've got some egg hunts taking place um, at our swimming pool facility. We're doing a couple different days with our indoor playground program. And then we're doing another egg hunt in the pool where we throw the eggs in the pool and they float and then everyone fills their baskets and they turn them in for candy. So that was something that we started prior to the pandemic that was very popular and we're bringing it back this year. And then we've got a lifeguard certification class taking place uh, April 21st through the 23rd. And we still have a few spots left for that. So that's the end of my report. Uh, Melissa, just one question. You mentioned we were 41% of you know ability to meet our need but how many how many children are we talking about or how many people i shouldn't always say children but how many people are in swim lessons i mean how many people are we able to service with that so i just sent this so in this summer, this past quarter we had 626 participants in our lesson 336 of those people were unique participants and so, so, you know, some people are able to get into multiple sessions. Um, but there's 1,508 people on the wait list. And part of what I know is also happening is not everyone is putting their name on those wait lists because there's just a certain point where it gets so long that they know they're not getting into the class. So, and this is something we even saw in the summer. I mean, our classes, we can only hold you know, anywhere between six and eight kids a class. And there's some of them where we have, I think our highest one was like 95 people on that wait list. So it really depends on the level. And part of that is, you know, a backlog from the pandemic, but this is stuff that we saw before the pandemic and just, uh, you know, we're one of the only pools in the area. Westland doesn't have a pool. Gladstone doesn't have a pool. So we're, you know, trying to hit all those needs. 
It seems like a common problem. I know that the city of Portland has the same situation where there's um, not enough space, pool space for the number of kids that uh, are applying. Everybody's on wait lists. So, sounds like we need another pool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we add that to the list. Yeah. 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 The yeah. 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 <laughs> I was like, that's going to double your deferred maintenance because it's definitely more than $23 million to build a pool. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. How do you prioritize the signed ups? Are they prioritized first come, first serve, or do you prioritize Oregon City residents before Westland or Gladstone? It's set up as first come, first serve right now. All right, Kathy. Uh, good evening. My name is Kathy Wiseman, if you didn't know. Um, as Kendall said, I am retiring. Um, I put in over 30 years of public service, and 19 of that time was here. And I was very fortunate to get to work for the city of Oregon City and specifically the Pioneer Center. Um, April Fool's Day is my first day of retirement, and that was picked by design. Um, I'm sure I've given Kendall every single great hair that he has on his head. Um, so the first update for the Pioneer Center is that we'll be closed next week for cleaning. The staff do not go on spring break. Um, we are there doing uh, painting. There's carpet cleaning going on, uh, furniture cleaning, both hard and soft. So all of the lobby furniture, all of the hard furniture, the chairs, the tables that are used all year long get um, completely sterilized and cleaned. Um, repairs are done to all the doors and loose things that happen during a year of heavy use. Um, we have the windows being cleaned. And we clean out every cabinet and closet in that place. And it's a large building and things collect. So we take several loads of things to the Goodwill. Um, Kyle and his crew will be in there replacing light bulbs. Um, the facility is not in as good a shape as it is by accident. So to give credit where credit's due, it's Dale and Seth. Kyle, Denise, and John, who keep that facility in top shape. And we've had um, several consultants come through the facility in the last year, year and a half, and each and every one of them, the first question they have is, what is your capital improvement budget? And we've had none, except for this is our first year that we ever had any capital improvement money. So fixing that facility up has been um, the staff and working really diligently to put it back together. Because it, 19 years ago when I came, it was nearly ready to be closed because it was in such bad condition. So I thank the staff for all of their hard work. Um, it is a gem in Clackamas County. It is one of your best maintained and attractive community centers. So you can be proud of that facility. Um, I am, anyway. Um, so that's what's going on next week. Um, my goal when I left, when I'm planning to leave, was to um, have a facility and staffing ready to hand off to somebody. But as the old proverb says, um, senior center lady plans and God laughs. So uh, we have lots of big projects for Kyle to finish up as I head out the door. Um, and the staffing right now, we're 25, will be 25% down in staffing. Um, our recreation coordinator is, uh, has taken a, an amazing position back in her hometown uh, area of Ohio, Fairfield, Ohio. She's going to become uh, a parks director. So we're really pleased for her and her family, but that leaves a hole for us. Um, I'm leaving, and we don't have a new person yet to step in. Um, and we still have a vacancy in the kitchen. So there's some holes there that need to be filled pretty quickly. 
and Shirley Ryan, who has been our Meals on Wheels coordinator for 27 years, uh, has taken a promotional position at the community center as the social services coordinator. And we're really thankful that she accepted that position. Um, she's a cornerstone in that facility, as well as Debbie Taplin. So I know they'll hold the pieces together with the help of Melissa's crew, John and Denise. So it's gonna be um, a big effort on the part of this staff to keep it all running as smoothly as they can. So I appreciate all of them. Um, and so let's see, where am I on the list? Um, and recently we had, Kendall and I were in an interview and one of the women that we're interviewing asked me, she knew I was retiring because the position has been posted. And she asked me what I was most proud of. And I, I had to really think about that. And I, I think I gave her some lame answer about the facility and the paint colors or something, but that was Denise, because I always pick Band-Aid color. So everything beautiful is Denise, otherwise it would be hideous if I picked it. So I had to really rethink this, because it's a fair question. And I, what I'm most proud of is being able to do things that I'm told I can't. Um, I'm really a contrary person. So when I came here, I was told uh, we can't fundraise at the community center because we have union staff. And I thought, well, that's, I, I can get around that. But I was told no fundraising. Well, our Meals on Wheels donation account was at a negative $77.91. We raised over $274,161. And those are $10 checks, $50 checks selling wreaths, hot dogs. We've spent uh, over 109,000 on the facility and equipment. And so we've got about 165,000-ish left. So there's a healthy fund there for Meals on Wheels. In the Pioneer account, we had $15.05. So we've raised $514,614. $514,693. We've spent $154,891 on the facility. And that is your community contributing because they care about that facility. So that was what I was most proud of. So in total, we the, the staff have raised $788,854 um, by the generosity of our community. So that's what I'm most proud of. Um, and finally, so when you're at a facility or in parks for a long time, um, such as Ken, he was with Westland for a really long time as the director, and they, they dedicate something to you. So you get a plaque. And if you leave this facility, there's a plaque in the, the little lobby area where you leave and, and Denise's name on there because she, she made sure this building is what it is today. She, I think you found this property, didn't you? Larry Patterson, well, she put it together. Um, she has her hands all over this. And if we were gonna dedicate things to her, she'd have a dedication at First Street, Ermitinger House, the library. She's touched just about every facility in this town. Um, John would have plaques all over the trees. Melissa would have, Melissa's been at the pool for 16 years, there'd be a plaque there. But my staff put together um, some ideas and we wanted to get, uh, Prax input. So we've got um, we've got some samples. Um, the first one, so I've got three. With great appreciation, the city of Oregon City recognizes the almost 20, but not quite, um, years of dedicated service to the Pioneer Center. So it would be the Kathy Wiseman bingo cupboard. And this would be signed by our bingo caller, John Oreskovich. Um, that's my personal favorite because everybody thinks I play bingo and nap over there. Um, the second one would be Dale Smeltzer signing it from our maintenance crew. It would be the Kathy Wiseman janitor closet. Uh, and the third one, Debbie Taplin, who is always changing the toilet paper in the ladies' room, it would be the Kathy Wiseman bathroom stall. So we have to choose, and I have to take this back so the staff have something to remember me by. <laughs>
You guys get to choose. I need your input. You're the advisory board. Big <laughs> applause. Big it is, because that's all I ever do over there. Um, so that's my report. I do have one pet peeve. Um, I love Ken. He has been a fabulous director for many years. I got to um, learn a great deal from him. And you pronounce his last name Wooster, like rooster. Uh, almost. <laughs> So um, it's not like the sauce. It's not the Worcestershire sauce. Yes, well, without the Shire. <laughs> yes. Worcestershire part is how you pronounce it. So I thank you. You guys have been uh, amazing to work with, and uh, I appreciate all of your time and your advocacy for our parks. Thanks, Kathy. And uh, if I could say something, uh, every time I look at your monthly report, I'm constantly amazed that you do so many things over there at the retirement center. And from feeding people to entertaining people and making sure they're exercised and all that. So I think that it's uh, you've done a tremendous job over there. And, Thank you, Tim. Uh, it's great. But uh, I wanted to say thanks to Denise, too, for putting together that volunteer list that you uh, put in your monthly report. And uh, finally, it's something that uh, the city of Portland or city of Oregon City could look at and say, all right, if I want to volunteer my time, here's a dozen different things you can volunteer for. And I thought that I was that was Kathy. Cool. I was going to say, I was playing bingo. I was playing bingo. Thank you. Okay. Oh, uh, but now you need to volunteer. You have to sign up. You have to pick something to sign up for. That's true. Yes, I will. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and John, I think just calling out your reports, uh, I'm surprised that, first of all, the number of uh, vandalism and graffiti incidences there are in our fair city. But uh, I love your before and after pictures because they really show that you guys do uh, yeah, a lot of hard work in keeping these things clean and good. And uh, and then Melissa, uh, you're working at over 100% of capacity. Uh, I think that it, it's a testimony to how successful the pool is right there. So you, you've done a great job. Thanks. Emily, did you still want to make a comment? Oh, yeah, I just wanted to thank Kathy um, and wish her a happy retirement. Thank you for Thanks, all Emily. the work you've done. Um, I don't know you very well, but, you know, your name comes up all the time, and um, there's, it's just obvious that there's so many things in the community that wouldn't have happened if it weren't for you. So thank you so much. I hope it comes up in a good way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <definitely>, always, of course. <laughs> All right, so we're at uh, member reports. One, one last oh, person, oh, got Kyle over here. <laughs> Kyle, go ahead. Uh, I think the city of Oregon City owes a real debt of gratitude to Kathy for all the work that she's done. The amount of work that, that we can do and have to do uh, for that facility, and uh, she's so easy to work with. Uh, but we do have to constantly schedule everything because uh, the building is so utilized. That, uh, you really have to, to make sure you're not going to be interrupting something because there's always something happening there and you're going to be there regular all the time. Uh, you could turn on your mic. You're muted. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's that's one thing that I also be doing is is this one camera has been centered on me the entire time, <laughs> and so I'm coming in tomorrow and I'm putting tape over that for the next time I come and sit in here because I don't want to look at myself the entire time. Um, Things that we're working on directly uh, in the future for uh, the community center is we've got some new doors coming in and uh, we're doing a, a full upgrade of the door hardware uh, that uh, we've got some mismatched, uh, you know, things have been done piecemeal and, and so we're going to unify the design and uh, upgrading the lock system there and that's that's coming up right away. Um, at Armitinger House, we have, next week we're doing a power washing, we're doing a light 
detergent-based power washing. Uh, and that's going to give us the opportunity to see uh, some upgrades and some repairs that we might need to do. And we're also working on setting up uh, uh, just the scope of work of, of some repairs that are going to need to happen on the porch, uh, the south porch. So that's that's first step is, is coming next week on Wednesday. Um, uh, other than that, uh, for kind of our parks buildings that, that I'm working on, it's it's compliance season. Uh, so we have been testing all the sprinklers, uh, replacing fire extinguishers, uh, first aid kits uh, are next week, and AED, uh, changing out batteries and changing out pads. And so that's what we're we're doing. That's our beginning of spring is compliance season. All right, thank you. All right, now we're uh, to member reports. Does anybody want to go ahead and yes. report? Yes. Um, well, my report, I guess, Kathy, I can't believe it's 19 years. It seems like it's been forever, you know, way longer than that. <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, a lot of people, <laughs> right. uh, a lot of folks really don't understand that, that um, you're also instrumental in helping you know, working with other communities and uh, some of those partnerships um, are really important and people don't quite realize that there actually are some of those. But I know that when Westland built the uh, community, although community center, you know, it was like, well, do we want to duplicate everything? And it's like, it just doesn't make economic sense. So it, it, it was really kind of cool to you know, kind of form a partnership with Oregon City and and not duplicate everything. And we've we've shared things over the years, and um, and we still have had a, a great deal with our meals. And it just it just makes sense for both communities, I think. And um, just want to thank you for all your service to not only Oregon City, but you know, you have um, um, equally important role in Westland as well that most people don't even know. So I just wanted to point that out. So thank you. You're going to be missed. Well, thank you. You were absolutely delightful to work with. Oh, you made it easy. That's it. You want to say anything? I'm good. Uh, just one item uh, in the <clears throat> not too distant past. Uh, I spoke a little bit about uh, some of the concerns regarding uh, access to the river uh, down there in the Willamette with regard to all the construction that's going on. And, and uh, I'll probably jinx everything now, but to this point, uh, from what I can tell from visiting with folks who were there, uh, a good access to the river. There was no need for the, there was no closures put in place around the bridge so far that, uh, that I'm aware of. Now we're just getting into the key piece of the season where there'll be a lot more boats down there and uh, the access through uh, Sportcraft has been good. They're keeping that open. Uh, and had, to this point, I've had no problems from anybody that has contacted me. So uh, keep your fingers crossed if everything goes well in the next uh, 30 days, uh, we'll get the peak of the fishing season down there and there'll be lots of people utilizing uh, those facilities and trying to avoid uh, some of those big, uh, big barges. But other than some people complaining about noise while they're fishing, I haven't heard any real problems that, uh, that I'm aware of anyway. We've heard them. And uh, John has been really keeping an eye on that particular area and uh, notifying me if there's any issues. And we've been in constant communication with the Oregon State Marine Board and ODOT and uh, HDR, who are the project managers, when there are issues. So we've been really trying to stay on top of that. Uh, we also have uh, plans to, to meet with them face to face before fishing season to address uh, any of those issues. But we know that there's going to be increased use during the fishing uh -huh. season that we need to all be on the same page and be good partners. So we're going to be keeping an eye on that. Well, I just add then Kendall, I, maybe I don't know what the nature of the things that you're hearing the complaints about. I'm mostly talking to the, the fishermen that are down there. So it's not, I'm not talking maybe the same, the same people you are, but I'd be curious to know what some of those were. And if there's any way that uh, I can help, uh, I'm connected with a lot of different groups and organizations that uh, are utilizing the river there. So if there's anything I can do to help get the word out, let me know. But because uh, so far, I haven't heard too much, but you're just about out of days. The big, the next time it warms up, 
there's going to be fish there as well as people. And uh, I intend to be one of them, but, but uh, you're going to get a lot of people there very shortly. Emily, go ahead. Yeah, um, so something that came up, um, I'm on the NRC also, and something that came up um, at our last meeting, um, the NRC has it uh, in their bylaws to consult with PRAC, I think at least once a year. Um, and I guess um, we were just wondering if, I, I, can't, I haven't seen anything like that in the, um, the PRAC bylaws, but if it's something that, you know, kind of just in an informal way, like there could, it could be put on the agenda, just like regular um, communication um, between those two committees. I actually spoke with uh, Pete a little bit today about that. Um, and so, oh, okay, great. yeah, there'll be some discussions, I assume with him and Kendall um, and the NRC going forward about how we make that happen. Okay, great. Um, and then I guess I just wanted to say thank you to Melissa um, for all the work you put into the Spring Resource Fair. Um, I know there was like over 100 people that came, which for a first time event seems like a really, really great turnout. Um, and yeah, having the indoor playground was such a great idea. Um, everyone looked like they're having a lot of fun and lots of educational opportunities. Um, uh, yeah, oh, and then two more things. Um, I was wondering, uh, the NRC has been talking about the Xerxes program, um, B-City. Xerxes is a local uh, nonprofit that um, uh, works with uh, landowners and cities um, to establish invertebrate conservation programs. And they have kind of a plug and play program um, called B-City. And uh, I was just out today with the, some uh, folks, Wes and Chris from Public Works, um, planting some poppy seeds and public right-of-ways. Uh, and I, I think that's, that's something that NRC has kind of um, put forward as like a agenda item and priority for the next, um, uh, next year. And yeah, just to get that on the, on the agenda um, for PRAC. Um, and then also to bring back up um, the, just tying in uh, the public comment um, to get the chalking policy perhaps uh, as a future agenda item for discussion. Thanks, Emily. All right. Yeah, thanks. Um, anything else? And at this point, are we, do we bring up more future agenda <laughs> items? If, if, okay. you, if you like to, uh, just uh, as an uh, aside, uh, Jacob did inform me you are public employees. So uh, for, election for election purposes, so but you are considered public employees and he wanted me to share that with you. So thank you. So that means what, what kind of restrictions so, we cannot go ahead and lobby so, anybody? Yep. Yeah, it says you may not while on the job or during working hours promote or oppose election petitions, candidates, political committee or ballot measures? While on, what, the key word was while on the job? Yeah, <laughs> that's what it said, while um, on the job. I could have quite a wide interpretation. <laughs> it, it might only be the two hours. Two hours <laughs> yeah. 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 a month. Interesting. Yeah. Well, again, while the camera's on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Well, what are they gonna do to us? <laughs> Right. <laughs> so, Kendall, you were going to put together the talking points that we could yes. uh, at mm -hmm. least do that. All right. Um, does anybody else have any future agenda items? I do. Ken? Yeah. Um, I think we ought to address the by maybe revisit our bylaws. Are specifically, um, and I'm fine. I think the hour change makes sense. It makes it way easier for staff. I'm assuming to be here at six instead of seven, and. Um, but um, so uh, specifically, if we could maybe talk about the hours just to fix that, um, I think it'd be helpful to have maybe something on the agenda that identifies whether it's an action item or an information item. So we know, you know, if we're gonna vote or if we're just gonna be listening um, and maybe address how we're gonna deal with public comments. So specifically in the bylaws, I think that'd just be very helpful. Mm -hmm. And then I'm hoping um, that we can remove sport craft landing negotiations. I feel pretty good we can do that. Okay. Now. Um, and can we 
eliminate the, the West Good Neighbor? We've done that one. Are you think we're at a point where we don't need to have that on there? Now that's going to be coming back with new projects okay. that we're proposing. So that's kind of an ongoing. It's an ongoing okay. for ten years. So okay, we're in well. year, this will be um, coming into year four. If they've got okay. the money, we've got the time. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, and then uh, I didn't see anything else we could actually take off. So I didn't want to add anything else. I think if we could tackle a few of these, that might be kind of helpful. Be nice to kind of shorten the list and then reintroduce some new things. Like very good. Okay, thanks. Anything else that you'd like to bring up, Emily or Tim? No, thank you. All right, very good. Tim, you're good? Okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm good. Sorry, I'm a little bit quiet today. Most of my family has a stomach illness. I didn't want to spread that to you guys, so I will be there in oh. the next time. <laughs> thank you. All right, we'll look forward to, to seeing you then. So, I think we've covered everything. Thank you very much for your time today, and I got this gavel. <laughs> We're done. Uh, thank you. <laughs>